We want the people and the systems who are authorized to access the data to be able to access it when they need it. Pretty simple, right? If I can't access something that I need for my work, well, then I can't work. If our e-commerce website is down, well, then we don't have any sales. If we look at the attacks here, it again depends on what their purpose is. Why are they attacking us? What are they trying to gain from this? In the malicious attacks, that could be a DDoS attack. They're trying to drown the connections out with so many connections that either the system crashes or we just can't handle regular transactions. It could be a physical attack. They could drive through a wall to our data center or something else where they compromise the physical systems that we have or hack into them. Or it could just be a disgruntled staff member. If they got passed over for promotion for the third time and now they're angry, they might choose to shut a critical system down. Availability, gone. And just like the confidentiality, it doesn't have to be malicious. It could just be someone doing something that either they're not supposed to do or they don't know they're supposed to do. Regardless, if their web server is down, it is down. It could also be application errors. If an application is written poorly, well, then it crashes. Again, system down. And then hardware. I mean, a server can crash. It can just have a disk that dies. The air condition can die. Power can be out. Internet can be down. Can cause our data not to be available. And as with anything else, we have the appropriate amount of countermeasure. I'm going throughout this course to be using the example of $10,000. I have $10,000 on my table, or I have data that's worth $10,000. How much should I use to protect that? Well, it doesn't make sense to spend $100,000. The same with the availability. If you go down and you ask senior management, how much uptime do you want on our e-commerce server? They're gonna say 100%. Never want our server to be down, ever. And we can do that. I mean, we can have it up all the time. But what if it costs $100,000 or a million dollars? Is that worth it? And this is really where your job is. You need to translate what senior management think they want into what does that actually mean? I mean, maybe they're happy with 99.999% uptime. If they're happy with that, and we can do that for $10,000 or $50,000. Well, let's do that then. So going back to availability. We can use intrusion detection and intrusion prevention system. They are what they sound like. A detection system detects the attack and does whatever it's programmed to. That can be alert someone, that could just be start a blinking light or whatever we have it set to. Intrusion prevention system can do the same, but it might also take action. It might black hole the traffic, it might sever the connection, it might do something where it prevents whatever is happening. The danger then here is, yes, it prevents something. But what if it is a false positive? So intrusion prevention systems need a lot more tweaking. Then we have patch management. If our systems are patched and up to date, they're less likely to be compromised. If you remember the big hack where Equifax was breached and they lost 150 million social security numbers, I think. So basically half the American population got their social security numbers compromised. That could have been avoided two months before that breach there was a patch out for those systems. And that's the tricky part with patches. When the patch is out, then the attackers know there's a vulnerability, which also means they now know which systems to attack how. But for whatever reason, Equifax chose not to patch their systems. They had two months. And we don't just go in and patch the systems as soon as the patch is out. We go in, we test them in our test bed, on similar systems or exactly the same systems. See if it breaks anything. Look at what other people are experiencing with this patch. And once all that's done and we're good and we're happy, then we implement it. But we don't wait two months. And another thing that can help us tremendously with availability is redundancy. You can have redundant systems, redundant hardware, redundant connections. So if you have a critical system, Maybe you have two servers in separate data centers that does load balancing. If one dies, the other one takes over, does all the traffic. Obviously, they both have to be spec'd to run all the traffic by themselves. And most servers, when you buy them, they have multiple power supplies. Each power supply on its own can run the whole system. In the data center, you have multiple UPSs, you have multiple generators, you have multiple HVACs. So if one component dies, everything is still fine. 
or at least you're supposed to have that. I have worked in a data center where we had enough power, we had enough UPSs, but because the server team were lazy, they put the majority of the servers on one side of the room, which you can do fine if you run the power cables. They did not. Each side of the room had two UPSs. The left side of the room, I think, was at maybe 120% of one UPS. The other side, 60%. With 60% failed, no problem. That's one UPS can take it 60% easy. Other side could not. So when someone, by mistake, shut one UPS off on the side with 120%, then all of a sudden, the last UPS left was 120% load, and to save itself, it shut itself down meaning two-thirds of the entire data center was out. That is what we call an RPE, Resume Producing Event. Do not do it. We could also on our systems use RAID, meaning we have the data on multiple disks. We can either do that with mirroring or striping. Either way, we built this system, so if one or two or three or however many hard disks we want, as redundancy fails, then the system is still up. Most systems today have hot swappable hard drives. You can get an alert saying, disk number three on this server is predicted to fail. Then go down, you pull the disk out, you add a new disk, and problem solved. We also want redundant traffic paths. Servers, again, have multiple network cards. They should go to two or more different switches, that is connected to two and more different routers, that are connected to two or more different ISPs. If one ISP goes down, or the router, or the switch, or whatever point in that network, if anything fails, we still have a connection out on the other path. So you can see redundancy, redundancy, redundancy. And of course, we design it where it makes sense. If we have a server with, I don't know, access databases that are used for reports every three months, we might not want so much redundancy on that. It doesn't make fiscal sense. But if we have a production server, let's say patient data at a hospital, well, that is critical. We need that up all the time, no downtime. Here, we would have the multiple servers. They would have multiple power supplies, multiple network cards, RAID, different network connections, UPSs. Everything would be redundant. So if, for whatever reason, that one server dies, we are still good. <laughs> I hope that was not too much ranting about availability. But since these three are such core principles that are going to go back to everything else we do in the rest of this course, I think it makes sense to go a little more in depth here and be very clear on why we do it and how we do it. So now that we're a little more clear on the threats and what we can do to prevent them against the CIA triad, let's also look at how they work together. Because as mentioned, we need the right mix for whatever we are protecting. With my website, confidentiality is not a huge problem as long as it's not personal data. If it's come by my stuff or read my blog or whatever, well, then I don't want it to be confidential. I want the integrity to be right so that whatever it says on there is true, and I want the availability so people can access it, but the confidentiality doesn't matter so much. And this is where, in its essence, IT security is. It's the right mix of these three to protect whatever you are protecting. If we have too much confidentiality, if it's too difficult to get to the data, then we have less availability which in some cases is fine. The same with the integrity. If there's excessive integrity checks on the data, it's going to slow down and you might not be able to use it how you should. And as you can see, this is how the integrity and the confidentiality are tied closely together. If we have too much availability, then both integrity and confidentiality can suffer. And let's close out this lecture by looking at the opposites of the CIA triad, disclosure, alteration, and destruction, or DAD. For most things in IT security, luckily, things are what they sound like. Disclosure makes sense. Our data is disclosed. It's the opposite of confidentiality. Someone who is not supposed to be able to access that data gets access to it. Alteration. They're altering our data. Again, the opposite of integrity. We may or may not know what they changed or that they changed anything at all. And then finally, availability, destruction. And destruction does sound a little harsh, but if our data or our systems are either destroyed or rendered inaccessible, well, then it's destruction. If a DDoS attacks bring my server down, then at that point, the data is not available. We can't use it how we should. 
on the exam, I don't think you're going to get any definition questions, that is, confidentiality or integrity, because they really are the basis of IT security. You might see something where it describes a scenario, and then we have a message, we encrypt it, we digitally sign it, then what do we have here? And then the answer options will be confidentiality, availability, integrity, non-repudiation, authentication, in some sort of mix. And then you need to understand both how encryption and digital signatures work to pick the right answer. And in this case, if we encrypt and we digitally sign, then we get confidentiality, we get authentication, we get non-repudiation, and we get integrity. At this point, this is not something I would expect you to know, because we have not covered encryption and we have not covered digital signatures. But just understand, the CIA triad is so fundamental, it is going to be something that you need to understand throughout the entire curriculum. So really, anything you learn from here on out, think how does this apply to the CIA triad. And with that, let's move to the next lecture. In this lecture, we're going to cover IAAA, Identification, Authentication, Authorization, and Accountability. In some other coursewares, you might just see this as AAA. They leave out the identification. I'm going to leave it in here for two reasons. First off, this is how I learned it when I did my certification. And secondly, I think it is important that we also include that part because we need to know who is it we're authenticating, who are we giving that authorization to, and who do we hold accountable. And we will cover this topic more in depth later. But for now, let's cover the basics. So identification, that is something that identifies you. That can be your name, your username, ID number, employee number, your social security number. It is something that is unique to you. It is me saying, I am Thor. And then the system is going to ask me to prove that I am Thor. And we would always want this to be done with multi-factor authentication. And multi-factor just means it is two or more of these types of authentication. Type 1. Something you know. It's a knowledge factor. It's something you are expected to memorize. That can be your password. It can be a passphrase. It can be the pin on your credit card. But it is something that you know. Type 2 authentication. Something you have. It is something that you have physically in your possession. That can be your ID, or a passport, or a smart card, or a token. It can even be a cookie on your PC. And while you can argue that maybe it's not something you physically have, it is still a possession factor. It is type 2, something you have. And for this one, also keep in mind that a one-time password or a one-time pad is also a possession factor. It is type 2. It doesn't matter that it's named something something password. It is something you have in your possession and you're not memorizing it. And the first two of these, type 1 and type 2, are the ones that we use most commonly. That is what you have on your credit card. When you go to the bank, you put the card in. That's a possession factor, something you have. And then you type your PIN number in. That's a knowledge factor, something you know. That is multi-factor authentication. It is much, much easier to implement, and it is much cheaper. I think most of us probably have some sort of authentication on our phone whenever you log into your bank or whatever else you do online where it is important. That can either be a text message that is sent to your phone, or it can just be an authentication app. Regardless, you have something that allows you to do multi-factor authentication, which then brings us to type 3, something you are, or more commonly referred to as biometrics. That is something that physically is unique to you. Your fingerprint is unique. Your iris scan, your face geometry, your hand geometry, your ear geometry, all of those are unique to you. The danger here is we cannot reissue them. If you lose your credit card or your credit card numbers or your social security number or anything else like that is compromised, we can technically reissue a new one. We can't really reissue new hands or a new eye. So once they're compromised, they're compromised forever. And type 3 authentication is something that doesn't change over the course of a life 
unless something drastic happens. Your fingerprint today, unless something bad happens, should be the same fingerprint you have in 10 years. And there are some people that say, yeah, but men's ears grow bigger over age as they get older. And that is true. But the constellation that the bones in the ear is the same. They expand out from each other. So the ear geometry is still the same. I don't really know of anywhere where they use ear geometry, but that's not the point. The point is that over time, they should not change. Over here on the right, I have the login screen for the ISC Squared website. I use my username. That's a knowledge factor. Then I use my password. That is also a knowledge factor. With those two alone, we do not have multi-factor authentication. But when I log in, I have chosen to have multi-factor authentication. So whenever I log into this website, when I put in the right username and the right password, it will ask me for my authentication from my app. And with that, I have multi-factor authentication. The second A of the IAAA model is authorization. This is where we determine that now this person has logged in, they have proven who they are, now what do they get access to? And depending on the type of organization we have and what we do, we can choose different types of access models. In their essence, we use the first four of these. DAC, discretionary access control, MAC, mandatory access control, RBAC, role-based access control, and ABAC, attribute-based access control. Most common in the private sector is RBAC, role-based access control. If you are a network administrator or you are a security administrator, you get certain rights assigned to you and every other network administrator or security administrator has the same rights. That also comes with the assumption of need to know. If you don't have a need to access certain data, then you're not allowed. Because in most organizations, it's much easier to give you more access rights than you need right now to do your everyday job than it is to grant the access every time you need access to something new or an emergency happens. You have way more access than you need, but then you can't access anything that you're not working with. DAC is discretionary access control. That is what you have on a Windows system or Linux. You can grant certain rights to a certain folder or a certain object based on who the user is. MAC is mandatory access control, very heavily used in intelligence services and in the military. This is least privilege. We give people exactly enough access to what they're doing. If they need more access, well, then they need to be granted the access. And mandatory access control does this because confidentiality is so important in the defense industry. And then finally, we have accountability that can also sometimes be referred to as auditing. And this is where we trace the actions of a subject to their identity. If I log in from my workstation using my IP during my work hours, I can't really refute that I altered the data. I mean, there are loopholes and there are things that can happen, but it is highly likely that I did it, which then also provides us with non-repudiation. And then I have a slight warning, not so much for the exam, but for your job. Remember, the IT security department is not the most important department in the company. We are there to help the organization reach their goals. And I know that most groups in most organizations think they are the most important part of the organization. The only thing that makes us slightly different is that we span the entire organization, which then also sometimes gives us a bad name. Because IT security is just there to make our lives harder which is where we need to go out and educate people. We don't implement all these security countermeasures to make their lives harder. We need to, when we implement them, go out and get feedback. How can we help them rework their processes so they're more secure? How is this new application going to impact them? And then we take feedback from them to make the application work better for that team. And you are both an IT security leader, but you're also a business leader. You need to wear both hats, both for the exam and also for your job in the real world. For the exam, think of you as being an IT security manager, a risk advisor that is also a lawyer. Interestingly enough, lawyers do very well on the exam and they do very well because they have the right mindset. They read what is this question actually asking for. They don't come in and try to answer the question they want to answer. They read exactly what the question is asking 
and then they look for the best answer. You have to do this too. You have to put your IT security lawyer hat on and answer the question exactly as it is asked. And I am sure that I am going to tell you this again. But remember, I only repeat myself if it is something that is very important. And now that I got that out of my system, let's look at some security governance principles. I briefly touched on least privilege and need to know. Least privilege is us giving the user the absolute minimum necessary access they need to do their job. Remember, this is mandatory access control. If, for whatever reason, they need to access something they don't have access to, then we need to go through the process of granting them that access, and they need to justify why do they need the access. Then we have need to know. Remember, discretionary access control, you get access to way more than you need. But you can only access it if you have a valid reason to do so. If you remember back some years, Natalie Sulman was giving birth to her eight children and the media got a hold of some of her information. Now, Kaiser never figured out who leaked the information, but they did find that 15 employees had accessed the information without having a need to know. These were nurses and doctors, and some of them probably just wanted to go look around. This was interesting. Regardless of that, the data was leaked. It could have been leaked by someone who actually was treating her. That doesn't matter. Those 15 employees either got fired or reprimanded for accessing data they did not have a need to know. And they could tell that they have accessed the data because of the accountability or the auditing. They can see every single person logging in to view that file. Which then brings us to non-repudiation. Because that username and that password accessed that file, they can't really deny doing it. There is some gray here. Some users share usernames and passwords. That is also a big no-no. We don't have group passwords, we don't have group logins, and we do not share our logins with other people. It doesn't matter if they just need to go check on a file real quick. You are accountable. And then finally, subjects and objects. You will hear this throughout this entire course. You'll see it on your exam. You'll see it in the other materials. A subject is active. It is most often users like you and me, but it can also be programs. Subjects manipulate objects. And some things can be both subjects and objects, but not at the same time. A program can be both. If it accesses data somewhere else, it is a subject. It pulls data from whatever, a spreadsheet, pulls it into its own program. When you access that program, it is now an object. And then objects, they are passive. And that is really any data. Doesn't matter if it's a piece of paper or data on a server, objects are manipulated by subjects. If we look as far as the exam and IAAA, you're not going to get any questions that is just a sentence describing this is what multi-factor authentication is or this is what type 1 authentication is. You're going to get a scenario and in this scenario, what would be the best solution? And that could be something like we have a user on our internal network we want to make sure that it's an authorized user and not an intruder. What can we use to do that? And then most questions will have two answers that are more or less right. And most of them will have two distractors. And the distractors are really there just to, well, distract. They're not the right answer. And in most cases, you should be able to eliminate those. So to make sure that it's someone authorized on our internal network, what can we use? Then an answer could be, an intrusion prevention system. It doesn't really make any sense compared to the question. We could set up IP filtering. Again, sure, but IP addresses are pretty easy to spoof. Then we could say multi-factor authentication, which will also sometimes be referred to as two-factor authentication or 2FA, because I don't think I remember anywhere that I have worked where we actually used more than two. And as the final answer option, it could be an embedded digital signature. We have already ruled out the two options of intrusion prevention system and the IP address that leaves us with two options. So is it two-factor authentication or is it embedded digital signatures? In this case, it would be the two-factor authentication. The digital signature will provide non-repudiation, but that's not what we're looking for here. We're looking to make sure 
that the user that is trying to log in is authenticated. It is the real user, meaning this is two-factor authentication. So when you do practice questions, sit down, see if you can find the two distractors, eliminate those, and then argue with yourself. In this scenario, what would be the best answer? I hope that helps and it makes sense. In this lecture, we're going to take a look at management versus governance, where you fit into the organization, some of the standards and control frameworks that our organization either have to or can choose to adhere to, and then finally, we'll look at defense in depth. It's important to remember that we all come into the certification studying from different perspectives. We have different backgrounds, we have different knowledge, and the organizations and how we are used to doing things is different. And it is very important that you answer everything on the exam from the point of view that the exam wants, not what you're used to. You are an IT security manager, you are a risk advisor, you're not a hands-on techie, you're not senior leadership, you answer everything from the IT security manager's point of view. What would that person do in the ideal organization? And now that that is clear, let's look at the difference between governance and management. Governance is senior leadership. It is the board of directors. It is the owner of the organization. It is the people who set the direction. And then it is your job as the IT security manager to figure out how do we get there. Leadership is responsible for the big picture. They make the vision. They figure out our mission for the whole organization. They decide on the policies where you and the management team then translates that into the standards that we adhere to, the policies we have, our guidelines, our procedures, and our baselines. And we need very clear two-way communication between the leadership team and the management team so that leadership clearly understands the risks, the opportunities, and the impacts of the direction that they have chosen, and we explain to them how are we going to get there? How do we meet the goal that they have set? So in the governance part of the organization, they go in and they look at what are our stakeholders' needs. And that could be the board of directors, that can be the owners, that could be shareholders. Regardless of who it is that we are ultimately serving, we look at what their needs are, what the conditions in the market is, the options we have, and as mentioned, they're the visionaries. They're the ones that set the direction. And they do that through prioritization of the things that we do. They make the decisions. And then when they have made them and we have implemented them, then it's their responsibility to ensure that whatever it is we have implemented is actually taking us in the right direction. They also determine our risk appetite. And this is important. And we will cover this much more in depth later. Basically, we can choose to be somewhere on the spectrum in between very risk aggressive and very risk adverse. And regardless of what we choose for our organization, any choice has unique opportunities and unique threats. If we choose to be bleeding edge, risk aggressive, well that brings us a lot of opportunity, but it might also bring us a lot of risk. In some companies, that would make a lot of sense. In other companies, that would be a horrible decision. Regardless of what our organization is, it is not something you do. That is senior management. That is governance. You, you are management. As management, we plan, build, run, and monitor the activities that is needed for the organization to align with the direction that the governance body has set. And we are also responsible for our risk tolerance. That is how we're practically going to work with our risk appetite decided by senior leadership within our environment. The image over here on the right pretty much explains what I just talked about. The business needs, the board of directors, the owners, whomever has something we need to do. That is then evaluated and made into something we need to go here. 
They then direct us, management. We then plan, build, run, and monitor whatever it is we're doing. And that monitoring then feeds back to senior leadership so they can ensure that we are on track. This is obviously very oversimplified of how it works in the real world, but understand the flow. And when we look at projects later, and when we look at change management, this will be in much more detail. But for this part of the exam, just understand the flow and why we do it and how it works together. In most places that I have worked, we have had one of two types of organization. Either we've had a bottoms-up IT security structure or a top-down. Most places are not completely black and white, but they are more of one than the other. Bottoms up is basically IT security is seen as a nuisance by the organization. We are not a helper. We do the best we can, but we don't really have senior management's approval or buy-in. And when we don't have that, well, that kind of trickles down through the organization. Many organizations are like this until they have a major security breach. Then, often, they change to a top-down. With top-down, IT leadership and management are all on board with IT security. They lead, they support, and they set the direction like they should. And this is the mindset that you need to have on the exam. Remember, the exam is perfect world. Everything is done right. Since everything is done right, we have the top-down approach that we would want. And now that we have that wonderful top-down approach, Let's look at some of the roles of senior leadership, C-level executives. And remember, if you ever see ultimately liable on the exam, that is them. That is senior leadership. If you look at the image over here on the right, it is likely that above the CEO, there would be a board of directors and maybe above them, shareholders. But just for simplicity, let's use it like it is here. The CEO, the chief executive officer, is the leader of the organization. That person can also sometimes be referred to as the president of the organization. Below the president, we have the VPs, vice presidents. And there are in most organizations a lot more than I have depicted here and I have in my list. But for the exam, I would know these. Normally, over the IT organization, we would have a CIO or a CTO. Chief Information Officer or Chief Technical Officer. Below that, in many organizations, we would have the Chief Security Officer or the CISO, Chief Information Security Officer. In an ideal organization and on the exam, the CSO, the CISO, does not report to the head of the IT organization. They have to report to the CEO. And we do this to make sure that no favors are played for the IT organization as far as security goes. And on the org chart over here on the right, you can see it says CEO and the C-suite are ultimately liable. You are below that square. That does not mean in any way, if you do something you're not supposed to do, that you're not liable. But ultimate is the key word. You would be below that. You would be either the chief security officer, the CISO, or someone just below that, the IT security manager, or something like that. And as mentioned, there are many other C-level executives in any organization. The only other one that I think you need to know for the exam is the CFO, Chief Financial Officer. They are the money. And they're important because it's their job to make sure that the organization is financially viable. And if you can explain to them and show them whatever security implementation you're doing can save us money or potentially save us money, they can be a great ally.
Now let's take a look at some of the standards and control frameworks that we need to know for the exam. And for the exam, understand what they are, how they work, but you do not need to know how to implement them. First up, we have the PCI DSS standard. And we will cover this one more in depth later when we look at laws and regulations and standards. But it is a standard that the payment card industry uses for those who wants to issue or handle credit cards. And while it is a standard, it is also required. All the big companies that issue credit cards have made this standard and they have made it pretty rigorous because they don't want the government to come in and make a law. If they keep the standard strong and ensure that everybody who issues credit cards adhere to it, and if they don't, they get punished or get banned from issuing credit cards, if they do a good job, it is very likely that the government won't come in and change it. Then we have Octave, Operationally Critical Threat Asset and Vulnerability Evaluation. And really, the key word here is it is self-directed risk management. It is a team-oriented approach where we go in and assess the organizational and IT risks in facilitated workshops. For most of these, I would suggest you go and look a little more at it, but probably for the exam, this is the level of knowledge that you need. COVID, Control Objectives for Information and Related Technology. And if you look at the name, it has IT at the end, that is a good indicator. It is goals for the IT organization. We take our stakeholders' needs and then map them down into IT-related goals. COVID has four domains, and when we get into project management later in the course, you will recognize the flow. First off, we plan and organize. Then we acquire and implement. We deliver and support. And then we monitor and evaluate. And each of those categories then have subcategories. For the exam though, COVID, goals for IT, we take our stakeholders' needs and then map those into IT-related goals. And do not confuse COVID with COSO. COSO has an O at the end. It is goals for the entire organization, committee of sponsoring organizations. And COVID was developed from COSO just to make it specifically for the IT organization. And since COSO is for the entire organization, it's a higher level picture, more of a strategic point of view. And COSO also have domains, or as they call it, components. They have control environments, risk assessment, control activities, information and communication, and then monitoring. For the exam, I would just know it is for the entire organization, and it is at a higher strategic level where COVID focuses more on an operational level. Which then brings us to ITIL, Information Technology Infrastructure Library. I don't think I have ever heard anyone call it by its full name. It's always just ITIL. And ITIL is IT Service Management. And what that means is that it's a set of frameworks and best practices that we use to align our IT services with the business's needs. You have probably been in IT for a while and you understand how important processes are because processes ensures that we have repeatable outcomes. And that is exactly what ITIL is. We have specific processes for change, release and configuration management, on incident and problem management, capacity and availability management and IT financial management. And all these practices give us a starting point where our organization can develop the program that specifically is going to work in our organization. Because every single organization needs something different. And then finally, we have FRAP, Facilitated Risk Analysis Process. And here we are very focused. We focus on one business unit, one application, or one system at a time. And we do a roundtable brainstorm with internal employees. We analyze the impacts, the threats, and the risks are prioritized. And this can help us later when we do proper risk analysis. We have identified what is critical, what is important, where we need to focus, and what is not. And it is a relatively inexpensive way to start off the risk analysis, find out where we need to focus, and it is important that we have someone that can lead the effort that has great facilitation skills. And as the last of the standards and frameworks in this section, 
let's look at the ISO 27000 series. First off, we have ISO 27001. It provides specific requirements on how we establish, implement, control, and improve our ISMS, Information Security Management Systems. It uses PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act, and it is something that our organization can be certified in. And the reason an organization might choose to be ISO 27001 certified is probably similar to why you are getting your certification. We're showing our customers or whoever we do business with that we adhere to industry best practices and IT security is something we take seriously. Which then brings us to 27002. And 27002 is way more in depth than 27001. It is the practical advice that we need so we can implement 27001. It has 10 domains that we use for information security management systems. This is not something we can be certified against. This is the practical implementation. Then we have 27004. This gives us metrics where we can measure how successful our ISMS is. 27005 is a standard-based approach to risk management. And 27,799 focuses on PHI, protected health information. And it is protected health information. It is not private. It is not personal. It is protected. And now that we have looked at those standards and control frameworks, let's look at another topic that is super, super important. Defense in depth. You will probably also hear it referred to as layered defense or an onion defense. And it all makes sense. Defense in depth, layered defense, onion defense. Every time you peel one layer away, there's another defense there and another and another. And what that practically means is we implement multiple overlapping security controls to protect a certain asset. And that is both physical, logical and administrative controls. If I want to get to a certain server, physically be able to touch it, I might have to go through a locked door to get into the building. I might have to go through a security guard when it gets close to the data center. There might be a bad swipe at the data center. There might be a locked cabinet. There might be a login screen on the server. All of these by themselves don't offer that much protection. But when you have all of them, then there's the layered defense. They complement each other and makes it harder for anyone who wants to get to the data that isn't allowed to. So that example was physical access. But what if it's logical access? Same thing applies here. To get to the data that you want, an attacker might have to go through the IPSs or IDSs. Firewalls, routers, switches, servers, applications. All of these have security built in that by themselves might not be enough. But if there's another layer and another layer and another layer, it's much harder to get to what they want. And that really is your job in IT security. You need to protect your assets, but you need to do it where it makes sense. You need exactly enough security. No more, no less. If you have too much, well then we waste money on protection that we don't need. If we have too little, well then we're underprotected and our assets are in danger. If I have the $10,000 we talked about earlier in my house or in my apartment, well, how do I protect that? Again, same thing. Overlapping defenses that complement each other. In Hawaii, for instance, I lived in a condo. They had security guards that would walk the perimeter and around on the lot where we lived. There was a key fob at the elevator. If you did not have the key fob, you could not go to your floor. Then, obviously, I have a lock on my door. Let's say I did have that $10,000 there, then I might choose to have a safe or a security camera or something else, whatever would make financial sense to protect the asset that I have. And when we have those multiple overlapping security controls, then we improve our organization's confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And I am probably going to keep saying this. You're not going to get definition questions on the exam. You're not going to get, listen this, what is this standard? That's not how it works. You're going to get a question where it says, here's a scenario. What do we do first? What is best? What is least? What is the next step in this situation? And you then 
From the four options, pick the most appropriate answer. And also keep in mind that they may not use the exact words that you're used to seeing. This is very much an English exam. You might see something where they mention that it is a specific or targeted. Well, that could mean that is FRAP maybe. That could be one business unit application or system. Then you look at the rest of the question. Is there something where it sounds like they're analyzing the impact, looking at threats and prioritize the risks? And this is part of your exam training. You need to train yourself when you read a question to analyze it. Okay, this part, that could be this. This part, that could be that. Then from these keywords and indicators, what is the best answer here? And it is possible to have two or more correct answers. What is most correct in this specific instance? And remember, drop what you're used to doing. Don't think in your normal mindset. Think in the exact same mindset that the exam wants you to be in. Remember who you are and what your role is in the organization. And with that, let's move on to the next topic. As an IT security professional, you need to understand the laws and the regulations that are in the area that your company is in and that you need to adhere to because they have a huge impact on your work. On the list here, you can see we have six different types of laws or regulations. The top four, I would know stone cold for the certification. The bottom two may or may not show up, but just in case, know them. If not for your exam, you might need to know them for your job. To begin with, we have criminal law. And that is the type of law where most cybercrimes fall under. With criminal law, society is the victim and the proof in those cases must be beyond a reasonable doubt. And the punishment, if convicted, can range all the way from financial fines through incarceration and finally death penalty. And the sentencing here is to punish and deter. And I have had some pushback from my students who say, yeah, but hacking, death penalty? That doesn't really make any sense. And I would agree in most cases. If they steal social security numbers or credit card numbers, or they have a DDoS attack and the server is down. Sure, that's not something that we use the death penalty for. But what if they caused a nuclear power plant to melt down and a million people die? Or they crashed an airplane? In that case, maybe death penalty would be on the table. But in most cases, it is not. Either way, for criminal law, society, beyond a reasonable doubt, are keywords, punish and deter. Which then brings us to civil law. That will also sometimes be referred to as tort law. And here it is no longer society that is the victim. It can be individuals, groups or organizations. And in these cases, proof must be the majority of the proof. Again, keyword, majority. You may also hear of this as the preponderance of proof. It is more likely than not. And here the punishment are financial fines. And they are there to compensate the victim or the victims. Administrative law or regulatory law is laws that are enacted by government agencies. In the US, that could be FDA laws and rules, HIPAA, FAA, and things like that. And then finally, the last one that I'm sure is going to be on the exam is private regulations. We've talked about the PCI DSS standard. Anyone who wants to issue credit cards needs to adhere to that. If they don't, they can lose their right to issue credit cards. And the companies that are in charge of this, they are pretty strict about enforcing the rules because first off, they want to make sure that credit cards are seen as safe. And secondly, they don't want any interference from the US government. If they do a good enough job, then there probably won't be interference. And the last two here, customary law and religious law. If you are in a place where this is something that is used, you obviously need to know it so you can adhere to it. Customary law focuses on personal conduct and patterns of behavior, and it is founded in the traditions and the customs of that area or that region. And then religious law, again, it's a religious belief in a certain area or a certain region, and most often they include a code of ethics and morality that are required to be upheld. Since knowing the laws, the regulations, and the rules in your area is part of your job, understand very clearly which laws, rules, and regulations you need to adhere to in the area and the country you're in 
so you can make sure you do the best job possible. And that probably is a good segue for us to look at liability, due diligence, due care, and negligence. We have briefly touched on liability before. Remember, that's senior leadership being ultimately liable. But just because they are ultimately liable does not mean that you are not liable as well. And whether you're liable or not really depends on your due care. If something happens and you were supposed to have done something that could have fixed it, or it is your job to make sure it doesn't happen, if you have done your job right, you have researched the options, you have given recommendations to senior management, and they chose not to follow them, well then you have done your due diligence, and you do care, and they are liable. But if it was your job to do something, let's say secure a web server, and you didn't do it, and you didn't research it, you just pushed it out there, well then you didn't do your due diligence, you did not do your due care, you are liable. And I have had a good deal of students that have problems differentiating due diligence and due care. So I'm going to go a little more in depth here, so you are very clear on what is due diligence and what is due care. Very oversimplified, due diligence is the research, the preparing, all the practical stuff you do before you implement something. Then do care is the implementation and then the monitoring and confirming that everything is working how it should is also due diligence. Many also use the short mnemonic do care DC as do correct, you're fixing something. Do diligence DD, do detect. You are detecting something is wrong, you're finding a way to fix it and then you fix it with do care. DC, do correct, DD, do detect. Let's say we do a risk assessment or an audit. All the practical stuff we do before we do the actual assessment or the actual audit is due diligence. It is everything that we do to prepare. We make sure we have the right people allocated. We have the right resources, the right money. We have the time we need. All that is due diligence. Now, the actual risk assessment or audit is due care. We're acting on our research. We're doing the work. After we are done, then presenting the risk report, the auto report, or whatever it is we have, that is due diligence. And then, regardless if it is the risk assessment or the audit, it is likely there will be some actionable items that we need to work on. Let's say we found some security vulnerabilities on some of our servers. Well, then again, how we're going to fix that would be due diligence, the actual fixes, due care. And it is always an ongoing effort. It's not something we're done with because risk assessment is going forever. There's always things we need to fix. See it as a cycle. Due diligence, do care. Due diligence, do care. We research, we fix. Then after the fix, then we make sure everything's working and we research some more. I hope for you that has made due diligence and due care slightly clearer. Which then brings us to negligence. And negligence is the opposite of due care. And I mentioned this earlier. If you have a system that is under your responsibility and you did your due care, then you are most likely not liable. But if you chose to ignore the threat, you did nothing, then you are most likely liable. And that is negligence or gross negligence. In this lecture, we're going to be covering evidence how it is important.